Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight for this panel on Pope Francis and the Future of Interreligious Dialogue. Welcome to Georgetown University. I'm John Borelli. I'm in the president's office with the special role of promoting dialogue and Catholic identity. And um, we've been having a conference with a number of people, about 50 of us, discussing future directions for interreligious dialogue. And you know, here we are five decades after the Second Vatican Council and the, um, the initiatives in dialogue, especially into religious dialogue. And here we are in the fifth year of the pontificate of Pope Francis. And the future directions of interreligious dialogue for Catholics have a lot to do with Pope Francis and the way he envisions dialogue building upon the past and looking to the future. And so we've assembled some observers of Pope Francis. Some of these uh, panelists have been observing Pope Francis up quite close uh, over the years. Um, and so um, let's begin. Um, I, I suppose I should just introduce everyone first. Uh, and I'm going to start with Sister Mary Margaret Funk who's obvious to all of you on the panel, I'm sure, who is a Benedictine from uh, Our Lady of Grace Monastery in Beech Grove, Indiana. Uh, we call her Meg Funk, Sister Meg, and that's how you'll find her uh, in her email, too. But she served a very important role in monastic interreligious dialogue, uh, uh, an organization that promotes Catholics, monastics, and uh, Buddhist and Hindu and other monastics in dialogue. And she has spent most of her time in Beech Grove. Uh, she's been involved in dialogue for a long time, and she brings, will be bringing her pers perspective to this conversation. On my extreme right is Archbishop Michael Fitzgerald, who is a missionary of Africa. Extreme right. He's not extreme right. <laughs> right wing. He's on your extreme left. <laughs> and I hope he lives up to that. You know. <laughs> Michael and I have known each other for a long We met, I think, in 1989 at a meeting in Australia. He served 19 years as secretary and then as president of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue mm -hmm. in Rome. And then he served as ambassador to Cairo. He's somewhat retired, but he referred to himself as a shooting star the other day. <laughs> he doesn't stay put. He, he supposedly resides with the other missionaries of Africa at the Church of St. Anne in Jerusalem. But he's named, he pops up all over the, the world, speaking about interreligious dialogue and particularly about Christian-Muslim dialogue. And to my immediate right, not so extreme, is <laughs> Bishop Munib Yunan, who is the retired bishop of the Evangelical Lutheran Church. He's the Bishop Emeritus, I'm sorry, yeah. of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land, and past president of the Lutheran World Federation. In particular, he was the president of the Lutheran World Federation during the fifth centenary. Uh, the common commemoration of the Lutheran Reformation. Uh, a Palestinian with much background in dialogue, both ecumenical and interreligious. On the extreme left of me is Father Indanil uh, Kodi Tuwaku, who is currently the undersecretary of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue. He is our guest from Rome. He is the one from the Vatican who brings all of those eyes and ears with him. He's been serving there since 2012 as undersecretary. Before that, he was a, uh, on the faculty of missiology at one of the pontifical universities in Rome, the Urban University. He is a priest from Sri Lanka, a diocesan priest from Sri Lanka. And last but not least is this person on the left side who many of you might have recognized from photos and everything. When Pope Francis was elected, when uh, Jorge Berolio 
became Pope, we all started looking, what has this man said? What has he written? And the one thing we could all find was this book with a rabbi under heaven and earth, which was translated within a month's time. I think it's the fastest translation ever of a book from <laughs> Spanish into English, based upon 54 television programs, dialogues that he and Archbishop Bergoglio had carried on in Buenos Aires. Rabbi Abraham Skorka is here from Buenos Aires. He's this year at St. Joseph University, a Jesuit university in Philadelphia, and has joined us for today's panel. And so not much more time on introduction. Let's get down to some of these questions. I want to ask Bishop Yunnan first. You've had a great privilege of working closely with Pope Francis in ecumenical relations. You and he co-hosted the opening year of common commemoration of the Lutheran Reformation in Lund, Sweden in October 2016. In your common statement on that occasion, but I am sure in other statements by you and him or others regarding ecumenical dialogue, you refer to the great journey ahead of us. That is, the reference to the, the, that is in reference to the restoration of Christian unity. How do you understand Pope Francis's references to accompaniment along the way or journeying together? What does that come to mean to you uh, when you are with Pope Francis? Yeah, thank you very much. I would like to start, you know, um, in such a way that there was an Anglican theologian who was Andrew, Andrew Mag Magwan, who said that ecumenism is living, you know, a long winter time at the moment. <laughs> hmm. And I think, you know, uh, what, what happened in Lund and the co-hosted session in Lund between the Pope Francis and myself and the General Secretary of the LWF was very remarkable. In, the, in this accompaniment which we are, you are speaking about, there were three important things. First, there was a thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for the loyalty and faithfulness of the gospel in both churches. And that's very remarkable. <clears throat> The second thing, there was repentance. We repented about for the mistakes of the past, which both churches have done against each other. This is part of the accompaniment. And thirdly, we really had commitment. We committed ourselves that we should work together and that we commit ourselves that we will no more speak negatively against each, each other but at the same time, work together and speak positively. This is the reason it's very important to understand that Lund has created a positive energy. Like the work of the Holy Spirit, it has not remained in one place alone. I'm confident that this positive energy will spread throughout our global churches. The great journey is ahead of us. This is true. Lund will not be a lonely event in the church history, but the initiation of a long journey together in mission and together in the service of humanity to further God's kingdom and our globalized world. This is the reason that Pope Francis says there is no going back, only forward with unity. Although we still Lund, we did not solve all the problems between Lutherans and Catholics, but we agreed to journey together. Why? So there are still three points which we have to deal, the disagreement, theological disagreement, between Lutherans and Catholics. It's about the ministry, ecclesiology, and the Eucharist, and the three are linked together. But I want to tell you what are the positive things, I want to tell you three things that are positive from Lund, which, which gives you the, un, uh, the understanding of accompaniment. First of all, the joint documentation, docu document from conflict to communion has again reminded us that the holy sacrament of baptism 
unites all Christians, not only Lutherans and Catholics. And holy baptism engrafts us in the one body of Jesus Christ. Always Pope Francis emphasizes on this. Once you are engrafted, then you are sisters and brothers in Christ. Then you are called for inclusive mission, including prophetic diaconia. This can only be done together, but not separately. This is the reason we dare together to be together in this great journey as baptized sisters and brothers in the one Christ. Secondly, Lund cannot be understood without Malme. From the, from the co-hosted joint service, we continued our joint co-hosted meeting in Malmö. There we committed ourselves to jointly address the common challenging facing all of humanity. There we addressed the issues of Burundi, India, Colombia, and Sudan, along with the issue of Syrian Christians. We prayed together. From this foundation, we committed ourselves to the work of alleviating human suffering, of being a common voice for the voiceless, for the voiceless in the world of injustice, oppression, and growing hatred. In Malmö, mission and diaconia were understood as faces of the same coin. Caritas International and LWF World Service signed a memorandum of understanding to collaborate together in the fields of emergency, relief, and development, wherever we can do it together. Such cooperation and collaboration are a visible sign of our unity, but also of our great journey together to be living witnesses whether we are, whether, wherever we are called to serve. And thirdly, finally, Dr. Muhammad Samak, Many of us know him, is my good friend, my close friend, Secretary General of the Christian Muslim Committee of Dialogue in Lebanon, has offered several comments on the Catholic Lutheran reconciliation in Lund and Malmö. Samak said, the task of the Muslims today is to defend and purify the Sunni and Shia to, to, to sorry, purify our faith from the criminal exploitation of jihadists. He also suggested that Sunni and Shia Muslim must learn from the positive energy of Rund to explore reconciliation between their communities as well. This positive energy of Lund will create energy and trust not, only, not just among Lutherans and Catholics, but among other Christian denominations and for interfaith dialogue. When the world sees our visible unity in a reconciled diversity, then we are truly living witnesses to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As Jesus said in his high priestly prayer, that they may be one as you and the Father in me and I am in you, you, they, you may they be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I assure you today that the Holy Spirit has guided us to an ecumenical spring. We are now in an ecumenical spring. It's now up to us to harvest the fruits of unity and accompany each other. Martin Luther once said, here I stand today as a Lutheran with the Catholics, and others we say, here we journey together. As living witnesses in our broken world so that the world may believe. Thank you very much, Bishop Yunan, for making this connection between ecumenical relations for Christian unity and these last two points connecting to interreligious dialogue, that the close connection that you live in your life uh, as a Lutheran bishop in Palestine and, uh, and, and your work in ecumenically. Um, Rabbi Abraham Skorka, you probably know Pope Francis better than anyone else. I think your cell phone's still on speed dial with his, is that right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> I need an opinion from a rabbi, so he, the Pope calls his, his friend. 
What, what gifts does Pope Francis bring to dialogue? Uh, Jewish, Christian, uh, dialogue among uh, all peoples. What, what gifts does he bring? The concept of dialogue is a, a concept that was installed, let's say so, with a translation, a translation from Spanish. You know, when, when Pope uh, Francis uh, speaks in Italian, he invents words. <laughs> so, so we are very, we are really befriended. So I use the same, the same custom to invent word uh, expressions. <laughs> um, the, the concept of dialogue uh, since Nostra Aetate uh, became something uh, uh, very special. Um, we, especially after the Second World War, when people realized the tremendous uh, and the, the, har the har harborable things occurred during the war, everything what happened, the Shoah in the middle, is where a lot of people that uh, were shocked from all of that and began working even before uh, Nostra Etate, they began working, uh, for instance, in Argentina, in certain places in Argentina, rabbis and priests began working the theme of dialogue. And since then, uh, Nostra Etate uh, and the Second Vatican Council, with all, not only with Nostra Etate, but with all the documents emanated from, the, uh, from this uh, Council uh, emphasizes that we must enter into the world of a dialogue in order not to repeat uh, <coughs> situations as uh, humanity passed during the Second World War. Now, uh, what is the special point in Francis, Pope Francis' conception of dialogue? Uh, for him, dialogue is not merely a, let us come together. It's very important, this is the first step. But he is a person, a, I would say, an accelerated person. A, when he uh, gets, arrives to sign point, immediately he is thinking about the second point. I remember, in our beginnings, okay, we shared uh, all kind of uh, activities, of dialogical activities, Christian, Jewish. But uh, we used to sit, when he was the Archbishop of Buenos Aires, and to look each to the other, and uh, each ask the other, okay, what is going to be our next step? And I will give you some uh, some examples in order, maybe that you know already uh, those examples, these examples, uh, and through them you are going to understand uh, the deep sense of dialogue uh, for Pope Francis. Um, when two journalists from Argentina finish uh, to write the book, the authorized biography of Francis, and they ask them, okay, uh, who would you like to be the person uh, uh, to write the forward? He said immediately, Rabbi Skorka, when uh, one of these uh, journalists uh, uh, called me by phone and told me, okay, we finished the book, this and this, in two days more, we need you <laughs> forward because uh, this is the decision, this is the desire of uh, the Archbishop. Really, I remained totally astonished. Imagine, imagine yourself. Uh, uh, the Archbishop of one of the most important Catholic cities in the world. Buenos Aires is very important for several reasons. Uh, an Archbishop um, 
He was then cardinal. And uh, his choice was, OK, let my Jewish friend be the one to write the foreword. These are uh, uh, really this kind of things are revealing what is the deep sense, in accordance to my very humble point of view, understanding the, uh, the deep sense of dialogue in, uh, in the, uh, how Pope Francis understands dialogue. To go ahead, to, push, to put yourself in risk for the other, it, to enter in new, to force new situations, new realities. Um, at some opportunity, I asked him, eh, tell me, how is that that you decided eh, that, eh, that you elected me, that you decided to elect me as the, the one to write a foreword for your special book, the book of your, of, uh, of your life. And he said, such it came out from my heart. This was the exact translation of, of his answer. But not only this, this occurred in the end of 2000. Uh, nine. Mm -hmm. In 2010, we began writing the, the book that you refer to. And afterwards, in 2012, uh, he was the great chancellor of the Pontificia Universidad Católica Argentina. And he was the one uh, who, decided to who decided to bestow on me the title um, uh, doc, doctor honoris causa uh, from this university for my contribution to the culture in Buenos Aires. Mm -hmm. These are, uh, uh, excuse me that I am giving personal examples. That's what we're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> That's why uh, we're here. Uh, mm -hmm. Personal examples, but uh, from these examples, you can understand that for, that for him, dialogue, he was the archbishop, mm -hmm. was to fight in order to disassemble structures. How can a, a archbishop fight? Because it wasn't so easy for him to obtain the, the acceptance of the people in the university to bestow me uh, with this with this title is um, hmm. when we was without a microphone in the middle because he was the one who put me the, the medal and who gave me the, the diploma he said he said to me you cannot without the microphone in the middle he said to me between us it was and I'm revealing this to you now uh, you cannot imagine how long I dreamt with this, with this moment. Mm. Mm. For him, in, 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 and I have a lot of other anecdotes. Um, dialogue means a journey. That's true. But a journey without a stop. One, once you arrive to one, once you reach a certain stage, okay, you immediately must begin dreaming about the next, the next step. Thank you very much. Father Indonil, you have the privilege of being able to go over and see the Pope, I guess, whenever you want, right? You just call him up oh, and... No, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. He's causing problems. Sorry. He's been known to call offices in the Vatican, but... Um, <laughs> you, were on, you were already on the staff of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue when he was elected. So what change did you see immediately in his approach to dialogue? Yeah, if you want to understand the person in depth, you have to understand the core message of the person. What I see Pope Francis's core message is mercy. Revolution of tenderness. Let me support my argument with his own words. 
Pope Francis says, the things the church needs most today is the ability to heal wounds and to warm the hearts of the faithful. It needs nearness, proximity. I see the church as a field hospital after battle. It is useless to ask a seriously injured person if he has cholesterol and about the level of his blood sugar. Mm -hmm. You have to heal his wounds. Then we can talk about everything else. Heal the wounds, he repeats, heal the wounds. And you have to start from the gr ground up. So according to me, mercy is the basis, the foundation of the vision and mission of Pope Francis. And we Christians, we often speak about Ten Commandments. So I have discovered ten approaches of Pope Francis to interreligious dialogue. The first is, he says, dialogue is for the common good. Mercy embraces justice. Dialogue is about seeking common good. The second is common good through triple dialogue. What are the three types of dialogues? He says, dialogue with the states, dialogue with society, including dialogue with cultures and sciences, and then dialogue with other believers who are not part of the Catholic Church. The, ch the third is dialogue and identity. Dialogue does not water down religious convictions. Pope says, Dialogue must be built on something, an identity. Then the fourth one is friendship and respect. We all, throughout the day, we heard these words. Dialogue and friendship and respect aims at a greater cause. Why we need friendship and respect? The motive is to alleviate the suffering of the humanity. The fourth one is bridging differences through dialogue. Pope Francis invites all Christians and others to build bridges, not walls, to promote peace. The sixth one is dialogue is a two-way communication. It involves speaking and listening, giving and receiving mutual growth and enrichment. And the seventh one is, dialogue is a means of conflict revolution. Then the eighth one is, be promoters of a culture of encounter, because it is an antidote for exclusion and throwaway culture. Then the ninth one is, Diplomacy of dialogue. Pope Francis always calls for dialogue to resolve world crises, placing the peace of dialogue at the heart of his papal, uh, his papal uh, diplomacy. <clears throat> then the last one is prayer and dialogue. Pope Francis also invites the followers of other religions to pray and work together for peace. So what I have heard from the testimonies of other followers of other religions, I think it is worth also sharing here before I come to the conclusion. I have heard people say, we draw great inspiration from his leadership and his encouragement to walk together on the road of profound spiritual dialogue. Some say again, I could see the sincerity and love in his eyes as he offered words of encouragement to all of us as we came together in unity, setting the tone of humility and simplicity. Pope greeted us one by one, greeted us all. He walked towards us to greet us, he walked towards uh, us to greet us individually. We need moral authority like Pope Francis. The conclusion is, 
The approach of Pope Francis to dialogue, particularly to interreligious dialogue, is an ethical call to heal the wounded people, often abused by various types of ideology, economic, political, pseudo-religious, cultural, and with the people to recreate entire societies on the basis of inclusion and participation. He wants us to foster a new culture of encounter to change the church and the world. Therefore, we can say dialogue of mercy paves the way for dialogue of action. And dialogue of action leads to dialogue of hope. Thank you, Father. And Daniil, your point on uh, be promoters of a culture of encounter was the message of the Holy Father when he came to Washington in 2015 and spoke it to the gathered US bishops. And that's, that resonates well with us uh, in terms of not so much a war with culture, but an encounter with culture. And your, your last point on prayer and dialogue is significant and leads well into Sister Meg. Pope Francis is not a monk, but a Jesuit. <laughs> <laughs> His practice is Ignatian, generally, and not Benedictine. But he's also been identified primarily as a spiritual guide. In fact, you could read some of his writings. It's as though he's taking the church through the exercises at times, the spiritual exercises. Now, you have often been a traffic ma manager around spiritual guides. Mm -hmm. uh, you have handled them very well. And you yourself have grown as a great spiritual guide in the Benedictine tradition. What do you see in Pope Francis as a spiritual guide? What stands out for you? Well, thank you, John, and thank you. Um, I wrote it out because I only have five minutes, and that's, that's tough. But in monastic dialogue, we've learned that an encounter is where we meet, and both of us are changed. That's an encounter. We've discovered a pattern of meetings in dialogue that uh, listening is more important than responding. If there's a response, it must flow from humility, as you said, and waiting upon the Holy Spirit. Now, John, at your suggestion, I read uh, the three books by distinguished Jesuit John O'Malley, who That's is- That's a plug, John. Yes. I read the one on Trent, Vatican II, and Vat Vatican I and Vatican II. And you're right, the one on Trent was a tr page turner. It's, it's, I recommend it. Then I read a fourth book, uh, The Mind of Pope Francis. And do you know that author, Massimo Bogassi? Do you know him? Maximo, no, no. No, okay, nobody knows him, good. Uh, <laughs> I didn't see the, go ahead. Well, it's because um, when I read the book, there was, I was taken aback, literally, you know, fall back in your chair, taken aback. Here's the short list of stoppers. About the hierarchy of truths, Mercy is the highest doctrine. Mercy unites beauty and truth. This is a time for mercy. Now, about unity is superior to conflict. About the whole is superior to the parts. About reality is superior to ideas. About time is superior to space. Now, these principles are sturdy and well-documented in this book, The Mind of Francis. My surprise was that these principles were so hard fought, so labored, so protracted in pages after pages after pages. These principles seem to me so self-evident, so obvious, so elemental. I sat back puzzled. Why the linear progression? What makes these abstract concepts so difficult to grasp that it takes point after point after point to get to the conclusion? Now again, taken as a whole, the three books by Jesuit John O'Malley and this book by Borghese on the mind of Francis was jarring. Is it because women come from a different place? In the, to be fair, the book, uh, The Mind of Francis, the subtitle was his, The Pope's Intellectual Journey. And I'm sure you could write his other journey, more the intuitive journey. But in a risky overgeneralization, let me try. Could it be that men live in their thinking mind and women seem to be at home in the intuitive mind? Now, we all know there's many faculties of the mind, but for this moment, let's linger on these two 
distinct patterns of the thinking mind and the intuitive mind. Now, the thinking mind is the literal voice received by the logical senses. Literal, logical, it's sequential, thought after thought, and is systematically argued to the whole. Now, the intuitive mind takes the content as a whole and grasps the meaning with one unified insight. Then it attends to the sources and the details of the content. Do you see the difference? These two distinct <laughs> ways of knowing are very different. The four books I read were examples from the kind of writing that comes from the thinking mind. I had to lay aside my intuitive mind to be patient as point after point was factored into satisfying conclusions. Now, the justification of mercy being the highest hierarchical truth was shocking. If mercy is the highest truth, why was it only posited in the fourth book and not the first book on Trent? My intuitive senses were baffled. Why has it taken our church, yours and mine, so long? What is this lack of confidence in the obvious? Can this be so? Has mercy just now finally arrived? Mercy, mercy. <laughs> it seems to me that we are in stage separating logic of truth from intuition. Yet there is a justice here. There's an issue. Women need to be equal voiced with men. This needs no further research. Uh, there should be more women at the conference, but that's not the most important point I want to make my few minutes before you. I don't think that there is a difference between a man and a woman as in gender in the mind. Both sexes have the capacity for logical thinking and intuitive knowing. We monastics can witness to the gender consciousness that needs to be transcended. My Hindu and Buddhist friends here would have much more to teach about that. In the monastic way of life, we find that gender does not determine consciousness. We learn from the transgender persons or the specialists in our medical community that gender is a continuum and even a both and. Mm. So then, what's my point? What is the way forward? John, do you regret inviting me? Um, <laughs> I knew you would be a fox among hens, so to speak, to reverse the thing here. Okay, okay. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm here because of John. Um, <laughs> what springs up is, oh, let's see, let's see. It is obvious that the logical thinking and intuitive ways of knowing are both necessary. Both training today favors, most of the training today favors the thinking mind. But from the East, again, we had it this afternoon, we find the training of the mind can shift consciousness toward insight and intuition. With practice, we can learn to renounce our thoughts. Yeah. Yep. Two more paragraphs. Ah, <clears throat> what? you came prepared. I did. What's... I just wanted to give you a heads up, but uh, that's fine. Oh, it's a heads up, too. Just two. <laughs> okay, what springs up is undifferentiated warmth of mystery. We literally can descend our mind into our heart and find that place of mercy. It's through contemplative practice of prayer and meditation that we focus our intentions. Through contemplative way of life, our hearts train for the mercy-ing, that word he made up, mercy-ing journey. We join the Pope Francis in his motto. We join not because we are a man or a woman, but because we have found our thinking mind and our intuitive minds dwelling in our hearts. So if dialogue is to the church what the internet is to the world, then mercy-ing to our souls is what shoes are to our feet. St. Benedict says in the prologue, we must run and do now what will profit us forever. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Meg. There is that story that during the conclave, uh, Cardinal Cosper would tell the story, that he had just gotten his copies of his book on mercy, which is an extraordinary book that was, came out in 2013. And they were in the conclave, and they were across the hall from each other, and the Pope said, do you have anything to read? Here's a book on mercy. Really? So <laughs> a, at that moment of election. 
Um, so, Archbishop Michael, you guided interreligious dialogue as president of the Pontifical Council, and you did all the work of organizing and directing it as the secretary in the 19 years, I think, in all. What change did you see in the approach to interreligious dialogue from Pope Francis, from your past experiences? No, no change. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the sense that there is, I think, a continuity, and that is what was given by the Vatican II, and particularly Nostra Aetate. Mm -hmm. All the popes, John XXIII started it, Paul VI concluded, and, and the first years, and uh, John, John Paul II, Benedict, they all wanted to implement Nostra Aetate. What I do find different in, particularly maybe a difference between Francis and Pope Benedict, is the insistence of Francis on the peripheries. Mm. And we see that when, of course, he, he wants to go off to, well, to Korea, uh, he would like to go to Iraq. Uh, uh, Bishop Yunnan was telling me that he didn't particularly want to go to Germany because he said there are other countries that need me more. Bangladesh. And, but the peripheries for Francis are not only those places that are far away, but they're those that are near to us. And we see uh, his concern for the, the poor and the homeless in Rome. And uh, so having his uh, almana uh, erect showers for the, the homeless in St. Peter's Square where they can go and have the barbers come there on Mondays and they get a free haircut and so on. Now, they, these are very practical things. Now, I think we can apply that, this idea of peripheries, also to interreligious dialogue. That the church is not a walled city. The, the church has to be out. He's, he's encouraging this culture of encounter. So the church has to go out to other people. It doesn't matter what religion they belong to. But because they, they belong to another religion, that doesn't mean to say that you can say, oh, they're not part of us. No, the, the church has to be outward looking and not inward looking. And I think that helps in the interreligious dialogue. It gives this impulse to to, you know, a bishop is appointed, um, founder of my society, we're, we're celebrating 150 years of our foundation, uh, Cardinal Lavigerie, he was appointed Archbishop of Algiers in the 1860s, and they thought that he would be the, the bishop of the Catholics. And he surprised them, he said, no, I'm the bishop of everybody. And the Muslims were suffering then, so we have to do something. That's why we came into existence. Uh, he founded us for the Muslims. Now, I think that's the same. And with, with uh, Francis, I would say that this is not, it's not a, a relationship of domination. We're not going out to, to um, even to convert these people. No, that's not it. We're, we're, we're out to to be with one another, to, we, to, to meet this uh, culture of encounter is very important, I think. So it's not a process of conquest, but a proposal of cooperation. Mm -hmm. We must work together for humanity. Whatever religion we are, whether we're Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, Jains, Sikhs, and, and that gets a response as well. Yes, we can do things together. It is this um, field hospital. That we're there for humanity, and let us work together for that. I mm -hmm. think that is important. 
Um, so, you know, Fra Francis has been, even within the Catholic Church, he's emphasizing the synodal process, the synod. We have to walk together mm -hmm. as bishops. We have to walk together as churches, different churches. And we have to walk together as different religions. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not something that he's invented. If you remember, if you go back to 1986 and the, the day of prayer for peace in the world that John Paul II called, at the end of that day, he said, this is what we want to be. Mm -hmm. yeah. the people of different religions walking together. We must walk together because if we separate, it will be a disaster for the world. And we must, and so it's, we find this con continuity and yet a different sort of emphasis mm -hmm. in, in Francis. Mm -hmm. I would say a second, I've got three points. That's oh. the first one. Ooh. The second one, <laughs> the second one, it seems to me that though we have all these things of these principles that he has, but that in fact, Francis more, is more interested in people than in ideas. Mm. Uh, so it's the meeting of people. And he shows that by some of his gestures. When he was visiting your land and he came into Bethlehem, he stopped. He stopped at the wall of separation. Mm. That wasn't on the schedule at all. <laughs> but he stopped there and he prayed. He was thinking of the people who are enclosed by this wall. When he went there, he invited you to come along with him, no? Yeah. 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 And, and the Imam also. Yes. And when he went to pray at the Western Wall, you, went, you accompanied him. Yes. Yeah, that's a powerful statement. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's not the only one who has had gestures. Pope Paul the Sixth. Yeah. Uh, have I time to? No, no. I was talking about the ring with the, with the Archbishop. Well, the ring, but there's also that he <laughs> fell at the feet of uh, Bishop Melitin, the Orthodox yes. Bishop, mm -hmm. who didn't know what to do. You know, he was he was showing him a gesture of respect. Mm -hmm. And I I mentioned this morning, there was the audience with the Saudi Arabians that we had, a delegation that had come from Saudi Arabia. And um, at the end of the speeches, there was an exchange of gifts. I don't know what the Pope gave to the, the Saudi Arabians, but among the gifts that they gave to him was a carpet. What's this, he said. Oh, it's a, it, it's a mat. It's a prayer mat. Oh, well then let's pray. And for the moment, there was a, a, a deep moment of silence mm. in, in the audience, which is quite rare in audiences. You don't pray normally. But the, it was a deep moment of prayer. And then after that, there was the photograph, and everybody was smiling. It was, we'd, we'd become a family through the prayer. You know? And that, that was a spontaneous gesture of Paul VI. Now, I think Francis is like that. Um, then maybe you're going to ask another question yeah. afterwards. What advice would I give? Well, that's, that'll, I'll leave that for later. <laughs> <laughs> and we could say that somebody else may want to ask that too. Yeah. But, but um, um, you've walked with Pope Francis many times. Literally, you walked with him in Buenos Aires, I'm sure. And uh, you very um, powerfully, you were there with him with... Uh, uh, Abud, right? Omar Abud. In, in the Holy Land. What has Pope Francis done to move Jewish relations ahead, Jewish-Catholic relations? In Argentina, he had uh, many uh, Jewish uh, friends in the sense uh, uh, that uh, you appointed that uh, for him, for him is very important the person. Um, 
uh, he uh, has a special approach to, to the Jewish people and to Jewishness. And many opportunities he said, inside me, it is a Jew. Inside of each Christian is a Jew. He, um, for instance, he responded to all, I'm speaking now when he was Archbishop in Buenos Aires, he responded to all the, uh, the invitations, special invitations that different institu institutions um, invited him. I invited him twice to come to our special religious service of preparation for our uh, great holidays yeah, that, that we uh, have in these days. And he came uh, twice and uh, he delivered uh, special messages. And I will tell you what, how is the degree of his humility. The day before that uh, he uh, came to, to the synagogue, to our uh, Beta Knesset, two days before, he sent, uh, he sent to me the speech that uh, he is going to deliver, asking me if you have to correct something, please do that. Mm -hmm. He is a, a sincere, a humble, a, it's a sincere person with a great humility. A, many opportunities I spoke with him. A, frankly, a, he respected what you said about the, the respect that, or, or you stressed the point of the respect of the other. Is a, it's really a reality in him. A, what he did for, uh, for Judaism. He enhanced the dialogue with all the Jewish, uh, uh, the Jewish institutions, main institutions in the world. He became really deeply befriended with uh, President Perez. Um, the, the pilgrimage to the Holy Land, uh, in some way began when I told to him, uh, look, the President Paris knew that we are very befriended. So, and for Paris and for him were a special chemistry between them. I don't know if this is uh, English, this I'm translating from Spanish. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, uh, one understood immediately the other. In some, uh, some, each one of them felt, oh, I, I recognize some of, uh, of myself in the other. Mm -hmm. Is uh, when the cabinet of Paris uh, knew about our friendship, is they communicated with me. I told them, okay, send me a, a letter from Paris and I will present this letter with the invitation of Paris to me and to him in order to begin speaking uh, about Paris' wish. And what was the wish of Paris? I would like to receive you all the time that I am the president of Israel. And the... Uh, and uh, so we began working uh, this theme, and we began dreaming about the hack, yeah, the embracement of the three, of the three of us. We were uh, friends from Argentina, and uh, I told to him, "Look, this is going to to be a very impressive image for the world." Uh, it, it will be a tremendous image for Jews and for Christians that we are embracing one the other, showing that a new era begins. 
that all the clashes that we had as Jews and as Christians in the past uh, are part of our history. That, but that we decided with all our spiritual power to overcome all that and to begin a new era. And of course, that uh, our good friend, our good Muslim friend from Argentina was the third. Like brothers, uh, right, like real brothers. You know, uh, now we are not so much in contact by phone, but, but by, by emails. The last email from him I received uh, last Friday. And the, how is the beginning, how, how one writes to the other? My, my beloved brother, and at certain opportunity I told you, I told him, eh, you know, when eh, I read in your emails, my beloved brother, I don't understand that, that eh, so as we used to say in Spanish in Argentina, oh, my beloved brother, no, in a deep sense. And he told me, yes, yes, yes. So you are going to be an uncle de, eh, in a couple months more. Why, he asked me, because my daughter-in-law is pregnant. <laughs> mm. <laughs> is, eh, mm. This is, I, I, I am mixing personal things with, uh, with the general things uh, in order to describe who the man is. Because beyond the words, uh, beyond uh, the theories, beyond the theology, and this is the, the resume of uh, how I feel my dear brother uh, Jorge Mario, he speaks through attitudes mm. to approaching the poor people sincerely um, through the commitment that he has with mercy for each one. I remember a certain opportunity uh, he told me this. Uh, you know what, what occurred? Uh, for the ceremony of washing the feet is uh, okay. In order to demonstrate my living dialogue with all the religions, uh, it was a Muslim girl uh, between the people uh, that uh, I asked to be there in a jail, I suppose, in Italy. Uh, the, for the ceremony of washing the, the feet. So, uh, I res afterwards, I received from one side and from one on the other side, <laughs> from the Christians, the, the very far Christian, let's just call the Christians, uh, the very uh, the extreme, the, the, the Christians who are next in an, in an extreme, in a very right extreme uh, vision of Christianity, they said, what are you doing? They criticized me terribly. And from the other side, the, the, the Muslims uh, criticized me. It's forbidden to touch a girl. But he did that. And this, is, and this was a, a symbol. This is a symbol. So I saw so many uh, attitudes for him, from him. Mm -hmm. uh, two words, the other towards each other who is surrounding him uh, in his life. For each one, he has a message. It's, he's uh, very fortunate to have you as a friend, too. I mm -hmm. think. Yes, we can certainly tell that. Well, the advice question is for you, Bishop Yunnan. So when you sit down with the Pope and you settle the Lutheran Catholic question, then he says, Am I doing interreligious relations all right? What do I need to do? Okay. <laughs> First of all, I think, you know, we learn from each other. It's very important when I speak, when I speak with the Pope, I always listen what he wants and we learn from each other in all humility. And the good thing, as it was said, he, he, he likes not only to hear, as Americans say, but to listen, and that's very important. The second point, you see, there was 
some articles against Pope Francis. It's not everything positive as we are trying in this session. Yeah. Some people, you know, and I've read them, they have accused him that he is going in the prayer in Assisi to form, to create one religion. But this is not true. He answered them in this way, and I've quoted him. Our religious tradition are diverse, but our differences are not the cause of conflict and dispute or a cold distance between us. Without syncretism or relativism, we have rather prayed side by side and for each other. You know, the second important thing, we drove together from Lund to Malmö, nearly 45 minutes we were talking together on politics, on the elections in the United States, uh, on uh, dispensationalists, the theologians, on many things. And then we agreed together that no church can do it together and no religion can do it alone. Doctor can do it alone. He said, which he took my hand like this and shook, he said, Bishop Munib, we have really to work together and be a prophetic religion. Because religion should not be the source of the problem, but the source of the solution. And even together we spoke, and I think I would encourage that, what he is saying, what Martin Luther King Jr. has said, that religion must be the guardian and the conscience of the state and politics. Mm -hmm. And when we speak of interfaith dialogue, I think interfaith dialogue must not be wishy-washy, but must really also be the conscience of the state of wrong policies, which are done in many states. Mm -hmm. For this reason, you know, uh, um, for, for this reason, Pope Francis, in addition to solving this, has another point that interfaith dialogue must be for building peace based on justice, and reconciliation based on forgiveness. And this sentence, which John Paul II has promoted in all prayers, Pope Francis repeats it. Yeah. The third point is, or another point is, interreligious dialogue must address the contemporary conflicts. And he, is always, he always was speaking on contemporary conflict, not only of human tragedies and wars, but also on climate change and ecology. He said, we have, we have neglected our world and misused it. Mm -hmm. Another point which is very important, where we discussed together and we have to continue to learn from him, is interfaith dialogue should address extremism. And, you know, when I got yesterday the Bridge Builder Award, I said that religion sometimes is corrupted by extremism. And Pope Francis wrote on the November 3rd, 2016, these words, may it ne never happen again that the religions, because of the conduct of some of their followers, convey distorted message out of tune with that of mercy. Mm -hmm. This is the reason interfaith dialogue must also address the hatred which is existing in, one, in our country, in many countries, like anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, Christianophobia, xenophobia. We cannot keep quiet because all this hatred are the same. Another point which is very important, last summer in July, he invited all heads of churches in the Middle East to speak on the, on the situation of Christians in the Middle East. He spoke on the, they spoke on the persecution, not only 
on, on Christians inserted in the Middle East, but on wrongdoings, like in Pakistan, or like Christians persecuting Muslims in Central Africa, or the Rohingya, or by, in Malaysia, that they are forbidding Christians to use the name of Allah, because they say, and I said as an Arab Christian, I used Allah 600 years before Islam <laughs> as a triune God, and now you tell me you are not allowed to use the name Allah. I mean, we, we, we are speaking on these issues, and it's very important that we address in interfaith dialogue the persecution that is happening either by Hindus to Muslims in India or, or in many parts of the world. If we just speak you know, about the skies and everything is fine, we are not there. Yeah. And this is the reason the Pope and myself agree. The advice I would give is one of them is, first of all, today we have to speak more on Jerusalem. Is Jerusalem for one religion or is it for three religions and two nations? This is very serious today with the American policy, wrong decisions. The Pope agrees on these issues, and we sp I spoke with him directly. Maybe today also we need more. Maybe Nostri Atete is 50 years. Maybe we need to update it. <laughs> and that is very important, because I spoke at a certain time in 1965, coming out of the Second World War. Today we are in a different area, with different time, different context. Maybe we have to update it. Finally, Pope Francis thinks, and that's very important to understand, that inter-religious dialogue cannot be limited merely to the merely to the few, to the leaders of religious communities, but must be also extend as far as possible to all belief, engaging the different sectors of civil society. Particular attention must be paid to young men and women who are called to build the future of this country. It's always worth remembering, however, that for dialogue to be authentic and effective, it, pro it presupposes a solid identity. These are his words. Without established identity, dialogue is of no use or even harmful. I say that the, with the young, in mind, but apl applies to everyone. This morning we heard the dialogue is there. There is no reception on the grassroots. The advice to us who are already experienced in dialogue, if we don't involve the youth and the women and the grassroots, the dialogue is good for nothing. Yeah. It's good for the shelves. The last point which I say, this is the reason I would again say, let us journey together with other religions for the sake of justice, peace, harmony, hatred, free world, and reconciliation. Thank you. Thank you. Let me, let me add. To oh, you add, and <clears throat> we, we also will turn to questions from the audience because uh, we have other questions, but um, I think we want to hear from the audience with your questions. But I, you I, add, would like, I, I would like to give you one example more in order to show you exactly what means a dialogue for Pope, for, a, for Pope Francis. The former Argent, Argentinian government, uh, the former president of, of Argentina, expressed herself a, a certain opportunity in the last month of her government, of her presidency, in a very anti-Semitic way, very. And the people approached me, Jews and non-Jews, and told me, okay, you have to, uh, to tell this, uh, what occurred here, you have to tell the, your good friend. And I did that uh, through a, a letter that I sent to him. And after uh, two weeks, I received from him a call. And for 15 minutes, all the time, he spoke with me about anti-Semitism. But what I am going to remember 
in my whole life is that after this call, I received a letter from the Secretary of State. He took my simple letter. It was a letter without any inscriptions, a, a, a handwritten. And he officialized that. And from the Secretary of State, I received an official an acknowledgement of the reception of the Pope, of your letter from this day and day and day, of this date, and a, an introduction a, referring to anti-Semitism in the world. It's very, very simple. He gave in my hands, he put in my hands, if the occasion requires so, a, a, a huge element in order to, uh, to fight with them against, thanks God, things that uh, come, no, come not to reality in Argentina. Uh, this is very important. This is exactly what dialogue means. Mm -hmm. To have a commitment with the other, mm -hmm. and where the other needs you, to be present. You ask me uh, uh, about his commitment with uh, how he improved or, or went ahead the, the relationship with the Jews. This is a, a little great anecdote, but it enormous anecdote about what means really to have, to, to have developed a, a deep dialogue with the Jews. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, questions? Do you have questions? I'm so glad to be here. I'm a Hindu, and I was born and raised in India. Three years ago, I hosted Cardinal Torin at our Hindu place of worship, Duga Temple in Fairfax County in Virginia. So my questions are the following. Pope Francis, what are his opinions, and since all of you are close to him, on Hindu-Catholic dialogue, because I have not heard much since those three years ago. Number two, what is his opinion about conversion through dubious means, which is happening in India? And third is that, does he embrace the word mutual respect? I did not hear any one of you talking about mutual respect in the interreligious dialogue, okay. which I so, believe is critical. Thank you. Father Antonio, you want to say something about the Pope's view towards yes, Hindu-Catholic dialogue? Yeah, with regard to uh, dialogue with uh, Hindus, as you all know, every year our Pontifical Council sends a message uh, when you celebrate Deepavali. That message is based on the teaching of Pope Francis, especially with regard to his views related to interreligious dialogue. And then when it comes to interreligious dialogue, as you all know, Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue exists to put into practice the vision and the mission of the Holy Father, the Pope, whoever may be. So how do we uh, practice, put into practice uh, 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 his vision with, when it comes to uh, promoting uh, Hindu-Christian dialogue. This year we had a dialogue in Rome. Uh, there were also some Hindu participants from India. We organized it. The main uh, the, the theme of the dialogue is Dharma and Logos in dialogue. It is on not only Hindus, Hindus Buddhists and Jains and Christians. Mm. So this is a big uh, uh, step. Then when it comes to conversion, and then it is uh, Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue in collaboration with World Council of Churches and World Evangelical Alliance. After five years of uh, dialogue consultation, they have published a small uh, document uh, a Christian witness in a multi-religious world, mm. recommendations for conduct. It was published in 2011. 
it was uh, thanks to, I think it was started, uh, 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 yes, uh, 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 Archbishop Machado when he was a secretary and all. So I am coming from Sri Lanka. I know how complicated the conversion issue is. It has multiple uh, aspects. There are conversions, forced conversion, unethical conversions. That is on one category. And then the conversion is a human right. Mm -hmm. It is guaranteed in the uh, liberty. One has the right to convert to another religion without any force. So that in a country, that freedom ha also should exist. Well, the human person should have the liberty to choose the, whatever the religion he wants. But it becomes a proselytism, it becomes forced conversion when there are uh, uh, other elements are uh, uh, involved. So when it comes to India, conversion also has different aspects. As we know, Dalit are converting. They converted to Buddhism because as a reaction to caste system mm. and as a rea reaction to social mobility, mm as a reaction or as a means to liberation from oppression. So conversion has di uh, different uh, di dimensions and Catholic Church from the beginning, from uh, Nostra Etate, is against conversion, forced conversion, affirms the religious liberty. Mm. So in mutual respect, I think each of you could tell a story of Pope Francis emphasizing mutual respect as, as a principle, right? I mean, it's... It's just uh, totally. Uh, mutual respect is uh, the base of uh, all his uh, activities, of all his doings, of uh, his approaching to, uh, to the other. The first point of uh, Francis in his, uh, is mutual respect, undoubtedly. And you know, you cannot sit on the table with other religion if you don't have mutual respect mm -hmm. and accept the otherness of the other. And that's part of Pope Francis, you know. And even if you read all the documents from other popes, mutual respect is, as you know, Rabbi Corky said, is the basis of interfaith dialogue. Without it, we cannot sit on the table. Now, conversion is a problematic. There are different reasons, but I hope we don't discuss it now because you know, it has. It must have its own symposium. A symposium. Yes, back here. There's a question, and then Hi. one up here. Hi. Um. Obviously, the uh, dialogue can be tricky, and especially when it comes to uh, aspects about which certain religions can be critical of others. So I was asking, uh, what I think is the role of leaders of other faiths? in sort of, sort of taking the Catholic Church a task over the recent um, abuse scandals in terms of dialogue? Hmm. This should be the Archbishop. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> At the okay, moment, let's... I don't think it's the religious leaders who are doing that. It's, it's, it's civil governments whether it be in Australia, whether it be in this country, whether it be elsewhere. It is the, the civil authorities who are saying, well, we're going to investigate and in whatever you say. Now, they also have to show respect for religions. Mm -hmm. um, there is principle of religious freedom and you have to respect. I'm saying that because of the a proposal made by the National Commission in Australia uh, on abuse in saying that priests, Catholic priests, should be obliged to reveal what they have come to know about abuse in confession. Now, they cannot do that. That, that is beyond the powers of, of the civil government to impose that. The, the, and the priest is not allowed to say what he has learnt in the confessional. He could only do so with the consent of the person. 
He's not allowed to do that. He can encourage the person who, to, to go and declare himself that he has, he has uh, committed abuse and, and then deliver himself. But you, you can. And I think it would be beyond the, the powers of the government to enforce that. Anyway, if that was a recommendation from the National Commission in Australia. I say that because I don't think it is the the role of other religion, leaders of other religions to, as it were, to, to correct people in another religion. You, you, they can give friendly advice, if you like. I don't know, Bishop Yunan might want to say something about this. How, it, because it's the same between Christian churches. You're not going to correct another church, but you can come together and work together. Let's work together on this. And that, that is, I think, very important in my own country of origin, the United Kingdom. It is very important that religious leaders come together to discuss the problems of society. And, and they do. And, and this is a sign also that we are, as, as Father Inudil said, the Religious dialogue is for the common good. We are working together for the benefit of the whole population. We're not just looking after our own. And, and that sort of cooperation is to be encouraged, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. There was a question here, right up here in the front. We have much to do in this country regarding these recent um, developments over the summer and actually reporting of events and data from long ago. But we have much to address there, and uh, that takes time. And uh, at the same time, we have these other initiatives going forward, ecumenically and interreligiously and in social justice. So we need to give attention to those as we prepare ourselves as a community to address our current situation. So question here. Hi, and thank you so much for everybody's contribution to this panel. Um, I'm Italian. I live here in D.C. I work for a conflict resolution organization, so everything that you're talking about is very uh, dear to me. I'm a big fan of Pope Francis, uh, and I have a couple of questions I would like to ask. So first one is, how do we reconcile uh, all the work that has been done and, and will be done for interreligious dialogue with sort of, if you will, the battle for the hearts and minds that different religions sort of the, I don't necessarily want to go into the conversion uh, conversation, but anyway, the fact that each religion in its own is trying to uh, bring more uh, uh, believers to, to itself. And the other question is, how do we engage uh, more profoundly those Christians, but perhaps also uh, those of other religions that are more extreme in a sense in their belief and uh, are brought away from uh, the idea of interreligious dialogue? They don't necessarily uh, give it the, the, the space and the, uh, the trust that it, it deserves. Thank okay. you. So in a way, taking it out of the realm of Pope Francis and in religious dialogue into these larger questions about, on the one hand, the extremists in our traditions who are very much against dialogue and um, um, the competition among religions. Well, uh, so does anyone? <laughs> Meg. I think uh, the monastic dialogue would have some experience to bring to you. Um, about, um, we've learned to start with ourselves. So the training would be each person, and Pope Francis was a Jesuit, he is a Jesuit. Mm. And that particular examen is a marvelous tool for self-critical. And was I on the periphery? Did I reach out to the poor? Uh, and, and also I would say the monastic dialogue, we refrain from apologetics in any form, putting ourselves up or down or side, but straight talk. And I think the particular examine in the Jesuit tradition is one way to get straight talk with yourself. And in the more 
older, we're a thousand years older than the uh, Jesuits. So the desert tradition <laughs> would be to uh, look at our own consciousness rather than our conscience. So training in conscience is good. That's a Jesuit thing, all to it, everybody. And then training in consciousness is this earlier monastic tradition. And they would answer both of your questions because you wouldn't be putting yourself up and down and, and you, wouldn't be, you would be straight talk listening to what the need of the other is. Thank you. And the, the examen, though, is of consciousness. Is of yes, your, we've had that talk before. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like correcting you or anything. Yes, it, it changes consciousness because you do it every day. And, and yes, we've had that conversation. You, know, you can tune in for part two if you want. You know, we have to be careful. You know, this question is very, very important. We have to be careful that we don't create battlefield of missionaries in many countries. And we have to be careful how to deal with these issues. You know, I appreciate what our father there said that conversion is a human right, but not by coercion or material, you know, a materialistic, you know, attraction. This is the reason we have many examples. I mean, we take Palestine, for example. We have schools, maybe, in many of our Catholic and Lutheran schools and other Christian schools, we have 70 or 80% Muslims. But we have never converted a Muslim to Christianity. We have really lived our you know, Christian ethos but we respected and we wanted the Muslim to be a good Muslim in a Christian school. In Galilee, we have schools where we have also Jews, but we want a Jew to be a good Jew in a Christian school. I mean, if you make the country a battlefield among you know, religions, it's the beginning of chaos and dissension and it's against the freedom of religion, which we are talking about. Yeah. Archbishop Michael. Is the, the second part of the question with about extremism, what, what can you do with this? I think what Pope Francis is trying to do for us, for Catholics and Christians, if they want to listen to Francis, is to teach us to be true Christians teach us to be true Christians, and that is to be like Jesus Christ. And he does that, he does that every Sunday when, before the Angelus prayer, there's a prayer at midday, and he gives a little commentary on the gospel. And if you look at those, he's, he's contemplating on the life of Jesus and what that teaches us, forgiveness of enemies and things like that. And, it's, it's only in that way, I think, that if you really get, and that's, that's part of his Jesuit training as well. Mm -hmm. and, and he's very, <laughs> in his sermons in the morning, they're very concrete. Uh, yeah. Not just ideas, they're very, very simple, but very, very uh, demanding. And uh, I think that that's, that's the only way that you, you have to try to get people to attracted to, I would say, to the person of Jesus Christ, mm. and so that we want to follow Jesus Christ. Mm. And then you won't go into this extremism violence, or the violence of extremism, that, because that's not the way of, mm. of Jesus at all. Father Ingenio. Yeah, when it, uh, buonasera. <laughs> when it uh, comes to uh, extremism, <laughs> terrorism, fundamentalism, First, I think we need to do a, a sociological analysis about it. Why do these movements come into being? And also Pope Francis is very much aware of socioeconomic factors that lead to, uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, create a fertile ground for the birth of these movements. So unless and until we eradicate the causes, 
that contribute to the birth of these movements, we cannot resolve this problem. Mm. For example, when he made the uh, popular movements, he says, uh, placing the economy at the service of people, working for peace and justice, and defending Mother Earth. Then the second question, uh, the, uh, uh, the, then I was also want to refer uh, some of the views our late Cardinal uh, Toran, with all respect, when he visited a historic visit uh, to Saudi Arabia. I will read it, that will really enrich our discussions. In his uh, 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 speech, he mentioned these elements. He said it in Saudi Arabia, equal treatment of people of all religions. Mm. Discrimination and double standards only increase Islamophobia and Christianophobia. Mm. Religious leaders have a duty to keep religion from being at the service of an ideology. Mm. Terrorism is a constant threat, and for that reason, we must yes, be clear yes, and never yeah. justify it. Religion can be suggested, never impose, and then accept or reject, then accepted or rejected. When uh, Christians and Muslims must also agree on some common rules for the construction of places of worship. All religions must be treated the same way without discrimination because uh, followers together uh, with uh, um, followers together with citizens uh, who do not profess any religion must be treated equally. Full citizenship for everyone. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a good place to end on Cardinal Turan, who passed away this summer, who had been leading the Pontifical Council. Um, this is Father Indanul's first visit to Washington, D.C. Oh, wow. uh, all the other panelists have been to this university before at one time or another speaking. Uh, Meg came and did one of my classes for me. That's how much I trusted her. So, um, <laughs> And I sat and listened. And in November 2013, we invited Rabbi Skorka to come. This was a few months, you know, March is when Pope was elected. And we wanted somebody to confirm, are we really thinking the same thing about this pope? Uh, is this really believable? Is this true? And he certainly assured us that it was true and even truer than we could imagine. And so I think we could have had a, this program with any one of the five guests here uh, tonight and, it, and had an exciting program on the topic. Thank you all for Thank coming. You. Thanks to our panelists. Thank you very much. And uh, there'll be a little time for you to um, speak to the speakers. Thank you. <laughs>